our clinic. Um, again, the name of our clinic is Carey Family Eye Care. We're located right here in West Carey, right around the corner. Um, if you know where uh, Carpenter Fire Station and Green Level Church Road is, shopping center there, there's a Harris Theater, some banks, CVS, that's where we are. The name of our clinic is Carey Family Eye Care. This is some of our staff. We've been in business since 2008. It was started by myself and my wife, Dr. Kelly Barnes. And one of the things I like for people to know about us is we are not part of a chain. I'm not knocking chain opticals, but um, we're a family owned and operated, a mom and pop kind of business. It's the two of us when you come in. We're the doctors you see. The staff that we have there is a wonderful staff. They're warm, they're welcoming. They treat you like family when you come in. Um, and my wife and I are residency trained optometrists, which is not something you necessarily always get. What that means is beyond the regular eye care optometry training, there's been uh, additional uh, training in, in optometry beyond that. So. that. I'm a fellow of the International Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control, and basically that's just the level that awards the highest recognition for training in this particular field. Currently, there's fewer than 150 of the fellows worldwide. And very nearsighted. So I know what I'm talking about when we talk about nearsightedness. I grew up my entire life needing glasses, high prescription glasses when kids come in and they can't see across the room. I know exactly what they're going through. That's so there, there's me as a kid. Um, so when I was when I was five years old, uh, my kindergarten teacher told my parents that I appeared to be having a little bit of trouble with my vision and that I should go get that checked out. So my parents, being the good parents they are, they took me to a local optometrist, a guy who's still practicing. He's an elderly guy now. It's in Wilson, North Carolina. He's still practicing. I'm friends with him. They took me in, and uh, he told them that I needed to wear glasses in order to see. So this was when I was in kindergarten, and um, what happened was uh, I, was my I had myopia, which is a really common condition. It means that I can see things clearly when they're up close to me. When things are far away, it's very blurry. I need glasses to be able to see. It's also called nearsightedness, and some of you guys obviously are already familiar with it. So I was able to get glasses, and I was able to see clearly for the first time. It was actually a, a really wonderful thing, seeing leaves on the trees, birds, things like that that I hadn't seen previously. Um, my prescription got really, really high. Um, our vision continued to worsen every year. My glasses got a little bit thicker and thicker. And uh, when I became uh, about fifth, sixth grade, I started wearing contact lenses. I was into sports. I wanted to be able to do those without wearing the glasses. Um, but even with wearing the contacts every year, it got a little bit stronger. And eventually, as you can see, my prescription got to a really high level. I don't know how much the, the numbers are for the prescriptions mean to you, but it's a minus 12.5, and that's a high level. As you can see there, um, under 3 is considered low, 3 to 6 is considered moderate. Where the cutoff is between low, uh, moderate and high varies depending on the study. Some people will say five, some say six, but at any rate, L over six, everyone agrees that's high myopia, that's a really high prescription, it's a risky prescription health-wise, and we'll get into that in a moment. And then they even came up with another word for if it goes over 10, that's extreme myopia. And so I got up to a 12 and a half, and this is a visual representation that I created for what the world looks like if you don't have glasses or contacts, and you're a minus 12.5. This is looking out the front door of my office over at the bank. You can't quite tell that that's a first citizen's bank, but that's what it looks like. You know, you take the glasses off and that's what things look like. So that's where my prescription reached. Um, well, going to training, what I learned was that my story is not actually unique at all. It's a really common problem. Children who are diagnosed with myopia, especially diagnosed at a low age, almost always become worse over time. Um, not only that, but the incidence, as you can see here, of myopia is increasing worldwide and not at a slow rate, at a, at a pretty major rate. So in 1980, when I received my first pair of glasses, if you studied the prevalence of myopia in the United States, it was 24%. Well, fast forward to 2010, and this is not even up to date. They're higher than this. This is a good nine years old now. Fast forward to 2010, it's almost doubled in the United States from 24 to 42%. That's not subtle. That's dramatic. That's a problem, okay? And you can see there's lots of areas of the world where it's considerably worse than it is here in the United States. So this is something that we need to keep a close eye on. Until recently, in schools, most doctors were taught that myopia, nearsightedness, was a genetic problem. There's absolutely a genetic component. There's no doubt. If you have one parent who's nearsighted, the child's risk increases for becoming myopic. If you have two parents who are nearsighted, it increases even more. But I started finding in my practice that more often I was seeing children come in that I was diagnosing with myopia whose parents were not nearsighted. So there's a little bit more than that going on. There was a study done a few years ago looking at seven and eight-year-olds of Chinese descent. So all of them have the same Chinese ethnicity, seven to eight-year-olds, half of them living in Singapore, 
half of them living in Australia. You can go to well, in this study, again, all Chinese ethnicity, all 78-year-olds, 30% of the children in Singapore were nearsighted. 3% of the children in Australia were nearsighted. That's not simply genetics, guys. They compared the two studies. There was really only one major difference between the population in these studies, and it's how much time they spend outside. The children in Australia, on average, spent way more time outside than the children in Singapore, and that's a dramatic difference there. So the main theory now is that the, the link between sun exposure, outside time, is that we need exposure to natural daylight to help control the stimulus for our eyes to become longer, front to back, what we in the eye care business call the axial length, and keep from being nearsighted. The sad truth of this is most of our children, studies show now, spend less time outside on a daily basis than prison inmates that are mandated to be able to spend a little bit of time outside every single day. So due to the disturbing trend that we're seeing with the increase in nearsightedness and the link that we found with daylight, in certain places in Asia where the rate of nearsightedness is even considerably higher than it is now, scientists have started working on experiments trying to create classrooms for children that maximize the amount of natural light in order to help with the problem. And uh, it remains to be seen how effective it'll be, right? Uh, this is a newer phenomenon, so they need to study this for years and years and find out is it really helping. If it is, I think you'll start seeing more of this work its way into other countries as well. So the World Health Organization, so they're a pretty big deal and they study things carefully, they have now started to refer to this problem as a myopia epidemic. And this is the more up-to-date numbers on the rate of myopia worldwide. It's high. It's a little scary in some places. Um, at the rate we're going, it is expected that by the year 2050, fully half of the world's population will be nearsighted. We're talking over 5 billion with the B people in the world that are nearsighted, including over 1 billion that fall into that high myopia range, over 6 diopters where you run into more health concerns from myopia. It's a lot of people. This should be very, very concerning for us, both as parents and as a scientific community. You can go ahead. Um, the biggest reason why it's concerning is not simply because the children need glasses to see. It's because when you diagnose children with nearsightedness, as I mentioned before, they tend to get worse and worse throughout childhood, adolescence, and their teenage years before they finally stabilize in early adulthood. Not only that, but as they become more nearsighted, um, they have a higher risk of serious ocular complications. So we're talking about things like a higher risk of retinal tears and detachment, glaucoma, cataract, something called myopic macular degeneration that only happens in highly nearsighted people. And those are problems that can cause permanent damage to the vision. So my main point here uh, with the numbers is we're not just talking about thicker glasses, right? Uh, people say, well, what's the big deal? You can wear glasses, and that's true. Fortunately, we can make glasses of almost any prescription. We can treat almost any patient with contact lenses using custom lenses. But it's more than just needing glasses or contacts to see. You can see the risk of these four problems, and there's other, but these are the, the big four we look at. They become higher with levels of nearsightedness, and the more nearsighted you become, the higher the risk is. At the current rate, myopia is actually projected to become the leading cause of blindness worldwide. The other thing that I like to mention uh, when I talk about the risk of medical conditions with myopia is people will ask me, what about LASIK surgery? Uh, when my child gets old enough, can they just have LASIK surgery? Yeah, they totally can. LASIK is a wonderful procedure. I recommend it to a lot of patients. And if you end up being a candidate for LASIK, not everyone is, and you go to a good surgeon, you have a good outcome, you can become very happy and live your life without glasses. But it's important to know that LASIK will not reduce your risk of complications from myopia. The issues with health issues with myopia come from a longer front-to-back axial length of the eye. LASIK is a surface procedure, so even if you become a candidate, you go have LASIK, you have a wonderful outcome, you may very well live your life without glasses, but your retina doesn't know that it's not nearsighted anymore. It's still longer front-to-back, you still have the exact same risk of retinal detachments, cataract, and glaucoma that you had before you had LASIK. So it's a wonderful procedure. I don't want to detract from that, but I always cringe when I hear a patient say, well, I had LASIK done 10 years ago and I haven't been to the doctor since, and, and I realize that is someone who really needs to be followed every single year for their ocular health. So besides time spent outside, what else is affecting this myopia epidemic? What's affecting this trend of people getting worse? Well, our children use their eyes way, way differently than they did even just a couple of decades ago. This is not an uncommon thing to see, right? Our children spend a lot more time on electronic devices, especially handheld electronic devices, than we did growing up. I certainly, you know, iPhones weren't a thing. iPads weren't a thing. They spend a lot of time on that. In addition to that, um, most of the patients I see that are young patients are not getting as much sleep as they did years ago. They're not getting nearly the amount of sleep that the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics recommends they get. 
there's also a lot of pressure put on children. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing for children who want to succeed academically, but a lot of pressure is being put on children at a very young age to succeed academically and to build their resume from a young age. Does it have an effect? I'm not sure. Does nutrition have an effect? They're studying that as well, but some of these things likely play a role. On a side note, if you're wondering how much um, sleep the pediatricians recommend children get, that information is available on the website for the American Academy of Pediatrics, as well as recommendations for screen time. Of note, the AAP recommends absolutely no screens whatsoever for children younger than 18 months, and no more than one hour per day of screen time for children under the age of five. That's not what I'm seeing clinically in my office. So because of my frustration with this problem, my career has really become focused on myopia because of my frustration with my own experiences becoming nearsighted. And so uh, what I do in my clinic now is, um, is we've really made it a focus to do what we can to slow down this process and we have some really neat options now. Um, I've decided as a clinician I'm unwilling to just simply prescribe stronger glasses for children every single year and watch their eyes get worse. So what we do in my office is I designed special corneal molds, kind of like a rigid contact lens, for children as young as seven. And I fit them with these lenses in an attempt to control this problem. You see, while sunlight uh, is shown to make people less likely to become nearsighted, it's not nearly as effective at keeping them from getting worse once they already become nearsighted. So in my clinic, I designed these customized corneal molds, uh, like a rigid contact lens, that children as young as seven put on when they're getting ready to go to bed. They sleep in it, and during the night it reshapes the surface of their eye, the cornea. And then when they wake up, because their cornea is reshaped, it's very similar to the contour that you would get after a LASIK surgery. They see clearly during the day without glasses or contact lenses. All they have to do is continue to put the molds in each night when they go to bed, and they maintain that clear vision. Well, that's neat and good in and of itself, but studies have shown that when you can correct the vision this way, as opposed to regular glasses and contacts, that do nothing to slow down progression, we can dramatically decrease the progression for these children and keep them at a lower level. The name for this is called orthokeratology. It's also called OrthoK, and in our clinic we call the program Overnight Sight. That's how we address it in our clinic. Since I started providing this service several years ago, I've fit literally hundreds of patients in this, uh, in this type of design, and it's been really, really effective. And now that the scientific community has started to really kind of pay attention to myopia as a trend, we've got other options as well. We've got prescription eye drops, and we've even got certain very specific types of soft contact lenses that can also be effective for myopia control. So with all the tools at our disposal, we can do a lot better than stronger glasses every year. And with the science moving in this direction, it's a really exciting time to be an eye doctor. So now that I've discussed the problem that we're facing, I'm going to go through some of the things that we can do and that we do on a daily basis in our clinic to actually try to help these patients. So once a child's nearsighted, what can we do to slow it down? Well, here's the major things that are used, some of which are more effective than others. Number one at the top, and I'm going to cover all, uh, some of these in much more detail as we go through, overnight sight is the ortho -okay process. It's been shown clinically to slow progression uh, by a large degree. The other two big ones in terms of major interventions would be atropine drops, which we will also cover and soft contact lenses. A quick note on the percentages you're seeing here. I took these percentages based on combining data from a lot of different studies. I will tell you, in many cases, we can do better than this. We find in our clinic a better than 77% reduction, but that's a pretty good reduction regardless. If you can slow it down by 77%, keep a kid who's trending toward an eight or a nine prescription and keep them down at a three or a four, that's a huge improvement in quality of life for that child and their ocular health. Atropine drops are used in various concentrations, but the more common one we start with is that 0 0.01. I would agree 64% sounds about right for my clinic on that one. Soft contacts, I'll cover in a bit more detail, but we can typically do a little better than 50%. That, that particular study was done on the first lens that was being used for myopia control with soft lenses. It's called a biofinity uh, multifocal. Um, it was not designed specifically for myopia control. It was designed as a bifocal lens for adults that was repurposed to that. With the customized lenses that we're designing now, we can do better than 50%. I would actually put soft contacts right there around where atropine is at around 60 to 65%. Bifocal glasses. So the reason there's a question mark there is that there's been a big debate among eye care practitioners for years and years. Do bifocals and glasses help slow down progression? And there's been a big group of optometrists say absolutely it does, and another big group that says no it doesn't. And it turns out we were both right. Um, 
In general, bifocal glasses are not terribly effective, but when we can measure the way they use their eyes up close, uh, there's a certain subset of patients who have eyes that tend to underfocus and overconverge when they're reading that actually can benefit from bifocal glasses, and it can be uh, almost as effective as some of the other methods. So we don't have to guess anymore. That's a great thing about science. Somebody studied it now, and we don't have to make any guesses. So when a patient comes in and they're concerned, one of the things that I measure is how they use their eyes up close, how their eyes tend to focus, and if that is a reasonable option for them, I can present that. And if it's not, we don't waste their time and money with it. We move on to something different. Under correcting with glasses, I always cover that when I speak on myopia because I have a lot of parents that are misunderstanding that. Uh, there's been a there's been a lot of misinformation out there, and parents thinking that you know prescribing less than the true amount is somehow helpful. Again, it's a wonderful time to be where we have these studies where we can focus on. Um, it's been studied, it's not effective. They had a really big study they did, it was done in Asia. They took two groups of patients, one group they corrected their entire correction, exactly what we found in the exam room, the other half they undercorrected by about three steps. Well not only was the undercorrection not effective in controlling progression, the undercorrected group actually progressed at a slightly yeah, higher term to be statistically significant, but the results speak for itself. That's not an option. So if you want to undercorrect because you're worried about eye strain up close or because you're worried about getting used to it, fine, we can talk about that. But don't ask your child's eye doctor to undercorrect out of concern that it will help them keep from getting more nearsighted because that's been studied, that's been disproven, that's old information. Atropine. Atropine's uh, used worldwide. It's used a lot more in, uh, in Asia than it is here, uh, but it's starting to catch on here too, and it is really effective. So they did some studies. Atropine is not new. Atropine was the original dilation drop. So before they came up with all the drops that we currently use now, there was one, and it was atropine. Well, atropine is crazy strong. If I were to take a drop of standard concentration atropine, which is 1%, and I were to dilate your eyes, you would be dilated the rest of the day and tomorrow and probably into the next day, and that's not an exaggeration. It's really strong, which is why we don't use it for um, dilation anymore. The side effects are too great. They come out with newer alternatives that uh, dilate your eyes only for three or four hours, so that's a whole lot better. However, atropine does have the effect of slowing down the progression of myopia. So uh, eventually people started studying and saying, well gosh, what if we use this lower concentration? Is it still effective? And fortunately it is. So the normal concentration is 1%. You can dilute that all the way down to 0.01% and still get an effect on myopia control, which is great because when you dilute it that low, it has minimal effect on pupil size, minimal light sensitivity, almost no effect on vision at all for most patients, and it can still be effective. Now one thing to know about atropine is, even though we use lower dilutions, we found that it is still dose dependent. So 1% works better than 0.01%. It's just not really practical because you can't send the kid around blurry to school all day long. But we generally start with 0.01. We watch them carefully for months and months. If we're seeing good control, we leave it there. If we're seeing progression, we can go up to a 0 0.02 or even a 0 0.05 maybe. So, um, and patients tolerate that to varying degrees. So we, we have some abilities to modify this treatment. So we watch their progression, we check them periodically, check their vision, and modify it if needed. Any doctor can technically prescribe it. Most doctors are not familiar enough with it in order to be able to do so effectively though. So you wanna make sure if you go to it, you go to somebody who knows what they're doing with it. In terms of getting it filled, because atropine at that low concentration is not commercially available, you get it at a compounding pharmacy. So compounding pharmacies can go in, they can dilute it down in a sterile environment and safely make it at a lower concentration so you can use it. Soft myopia control contact lenses. So again, the first ones they used were not as effective as we really would like them to be, but because myopia is caught on in terms of uh, the scientific community, we have better options. So nowadays, we use customized products that are made specifically and only for myopia control. Um, they are bifocal lenses, but they have to be designed a very specific way. So there are two different products that we frequently use in our office, and we fit the children in it. And just like with the atropine, we watch them periodically, we check their prescription, we check their vision, and make sure they're having the desired effect. If they're not, sometimes we move them over to an overnight sight type program, sometimes we actually add atropine and use the two of them together, and they can totally be used together. Um, I find that soft lenses do not work quite as well for myopia control as overnight sight, but they're a fantastic option if there's a patient who can't tolerate the overnight sight. So that's the deal with that. Um, and patients tolerate them well. They do really well with them. They put them in, they see during the day just like they would with regular contact lenses, and that's a great option. So finally, overnight sight. So overnight sight is uh, it's fun for me. It's challenging clinically. I love the, the program there. We have tons of patients. Again, we've got over 400 at this point 
currently in an overnight site program. So as I mentioned before, we custom designed these. They are designed specifically for an individual child and they reshape the cornea so that they can see clear during the day and control the levels of myopia. Advantages. When I say no prescription, it doesn't mean you can pick them up over the counter at CVS. What it means is we don't put the power from their glasses prescription in the lens. Um, all of its effect on controlling the vision and making them see clearly is based on how it reshapes the cornea, not by putting their prescription in the lens. So the power in that lens is the exact same, but they are reshaping their cornea differently to achieve this effect. It is also doctor designed. It's not, you know, call it 100 contacts and get it. We take a lot of really careful measurements on the patient's prescription, the way their eyes focus, their pupil size, their corneal curvature, and we design something very specifically for an individual child to get a very specific response from the child. So this is one of the ways we evaluate it. This is an actual patient of mine in an overnight sight mold on a patient. We use a fluorescent dye. So it's a fluorescent dye that we put in, which allows us to see the tear profile underneath the, uh, the lens or the mold. It's a yellow dye. When we shine a cobalt blue light on it, it glows and shows us where the tears are pooling and where it's not. And what you're seeing here is a very classic, typical bullseye pattern where it's fitting close to the cornea in the middle, tears pooling in the mid-periphery, then lining with the peripheral cornea. And that's one of the things we're looking for there. So we use this clinically to assess the fit to see if we need to make any changes. The software we use is pretty cool stuff. So what we've got over here on the left, and this is an actual patient of ours, we use the software to take into account the corneal curvature, generate a simulated fluorescein pattern, and then we take that and because the data is so powerful and the tools are so sophisticated, yeah, we actually get the patient in, put the lens on there, put the fluorescein in, and we get a really similar pattern. So that's one of the ways we can customize this and get the designs that we need to achieve our desired result there. So there's a couple of different uh, systems we use, a couple of different pieces of software, but I like this because I think it illustrates pretty clearly how it works together to create a lens that does what we needed to do on the patient's eye. Corneal topography is the most important piece of technology that we use. Corneal topography can be thought of as an elevation map of the cornea. So it's showing us where the cornea is higher, where the cornea is lower, where it's steeper, where it's flatter. And what you're seeing here is a typical before and after pattern. On the left, um, this is a normal, untreated corneal pattern. What the colors mean are the warm colors, yellows, oranges, reds, are where the cornea is more steep. Uh, the cooler colors, blues and greens, are where the cornea is flatter. Uh, a normal untreated cornea is not spherical, it's an A-sphere, it's steeper in the middle, it flattens on the periphery. And then what we're doing is we're creating a pattern very, very similar to what you get after LASIK surgery. So all you're seeing now is it's flat in the center, that's what gives you the clear vision without glasses, and intentionally it's very, very steep peripheral to that, and that's important for myopia control. And if we don't get that, it's not a good fit. Um, I like to explain that to parents so they understand what I'm looking for, and even when I talk to colleagues who are just getting started in this and I'm explaining how to generate the right fit and get the desired results. Even a lot of doctors who dabble in this don't understand that. You know, they'll get that flat in the center, get a 20-20 vision, and wonder why the child's progressing, and that's where the power of the topography comes from. And that's the point we're getting to with that. 20-20 vision is a desired outcome. We want kids who see clear at school. That's part of it, but that's not enough in and of itself. Just because they see clearly doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to slow down the level of myopia. And that's where we use the assessment of the mold on the eye and the topography. And I have patients every day that come in that are seeing 2020, and from time to time I'll have to say, well, they're seeing well, but I still need to change this design up because I don't want that patient to progress further than they otherwise would. So there's two different parts. They're not one and the same. We want 2020 clear vision. More importantly, we want to slow down that progression. And so the studies have shown we make that treatment zone a little smaller there, and we can have a much better outcome from myopia control there. No, obviously not every doctor can perform it. It's, uh, it's something that requires a little additional training there. It requires experience to get the results you need and be comfortable with it. If uh, I tell patients if they have a friend who's in another area and they're trying to help their friend figure out who to go to, one good place to start would be just to go to the website for the International Academy of Ortho K and Myopia Control. Because anybody with that designation has the highest uh, certification and training in that, so that's a good place to look. Again, there's not a ton of us around. There's less than 150 worldwide currently. There are other people who know how to fit it, though, certainly. You just want somebody who's got enough experience to get a good outcome there. Uh, technology, you really can't follow a patient without the appropriate technology, like the corneal topography, the software that you need there. And then you gotta trust who you're going to. Um, I think one of the reasons why our clinic is built so much since we started is because patients know that they can get a hold of us. They can call up Rhonda, and Rhonda's been doing this with me long enough. She can answer just about any question a patient calls with. If she does have something that, that comes up, she doesn't, she'll uh, refer it to me. 
I'm available if my cell phone program gets my cell phone number. I do field texts from patients on weekends and things like that and answer questions because it's new to them. They have questions. It's different from glasses. And they know that they can get an honest answer from us and get a hold of us if they have a concern. There is some risk of infection with any device placed on my eye, any contact lens, and I'm including soft lenses, but the risks are low. Um, in my opinion, the risks are a whole lot lower than your risk for a retinal detachment or, or glaucoma or something like that from high myopia. It is FDA approved. Um, a quick word on FDA approval. It's FDA approved for, um, for treatment up to six doctors of myopia and up to 1.75 of astigmatism. It can work absolutely higher than that. That's just the FDA approval they went for. So if you hear something about somebody being outside the range of FDA approval, it works the same way. It's every bit as safe. Uh, when they come up with the product, whether it's a drop for an infection or whether it's a contact lens, they go for a certain range of approval and then it gets adapted and it's used outside of that. People use off-label drops for infections and things like that all the time. Um, the most common complications are patients have to get used to it, right? It's a little bit less comfortable than sleeping without a mold, so they have to get used to the feel of it. Occasionally there can be some minor irritation which requires the design change in the parameters to get the desired result. The one um, infectious concern that we care about with contact lenses, and this isn't just overnight sight, this is any contact lens, is what's called microbial keratitis or corneal ulcer. There's a risk, the risk is low, 7.7 .7 events per 10,000 cumulative years of lens uh, wear when they combine a whole bunch of different patients together. And to put that in more plain terms, it's roughly the same as a soft contact lens that is designed to be worn overnight. Um, so, you know, patients come in and they ask about the risk, and I tell them, absolutely, I don't want to under, uh, underplay that. There is a little bit of an increased risk. That risk is minimized and very much acceptable and low when they listen to us, take care of them the way we tell them to, keep their appointments, use common sense, tell us if their eyes are irritated, and replace them on the schedule we tell them to. <laughs> Typically, as it says there, six to 12 visits for the first year. That's variable. Sometimes I get a patient that gets corrected way quicker and they're just easier and they don't see us six times. I get some patients that we go in knowing they're going to be more difficult and we see them more than six times, uh, more than 12 times. Uh, it really depends on the, on the patient, but um, it depends on complexity. After the first year, two to three visits a year on average, we're happy to see them more frequently if and as needed. Uh, cost. Everybody wants to know what a cost is. Uh, we have a range of fees. It depends on how complicated the case is. We take on pretty complicated cases sometimes. So it starts at 1800 increases based on complexity, things like the range of prescription, the corneal curvature, pupil size, things like that. Do they need an astigmatism correcting mold? A lot of those things go into it. I would say on average about 80% of our patients fall into either the 2200 or the 2600 range for the first year. Fortunately, after the first year, it's not nearly as expensive. It ranges about $665 a year for year two, three, four, and beyond. So don't let that concern you for future uh, years there. It includes everything you need for the first year, the molds, the visits, no matter how many visits there are, a warranty against loss or damage. Um, the evaluation is not covered by vision or medical plans. However, the molds themselves can sometimes be covered. It depends on your plan, and we're happy to check into that with you. Um, and then there's different payment methods, peer credit, flex spending, things like that. You can go on to the next slide. And the last one is the consultation is free. I really want people to take advantage of this information that we can provide for them, and we're happy to do a free consultation. The one little qualifier on the free consultation is every child needs an annual eye exam for their eye health. So you have to have had an annual eye exam. If you have a child who has had an annual eye exam and you want a consultation, we are happy to provide that for free. You need to bring in the records or have them sent to us for their exam because since I'm not going to be checking their internal eye health at this free evaluation, I need to have some proof for liability purposes that that has been done. If they haven't had a full exam, we can most certainly perform that full exam for your child, the regular vision and eye health exam, and we can bill that part out to your regular vision plan if you have one or you can pay that out of pocket. And then we can proceed with the free, evaluate, with the free consultation. But I always mention that because Kids should be checked yearly. Every, every kid should be checked yearly. It's important for their eye health. And so we're happy to use that, that visit from another office. I've got my email address there. I've got Rhonda's email address there. And we're really accessible. If you guys have questions, I think we've got a little extra time. And I am happy to stick around and answer any questions you have. Rhonda is happy to answer them. And so um, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate coming out. Uh, just let everybody know that my two kids are with Dr. Barnes. We're pretty happy. Okay. Yeah, just for your reference. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Ed. One quick question. Sure. Um, Myrothalin is actually the also K solution. Yep. It's just for stop the progression or slow down the progression. Mm -hmm. It's not for the treatment. Without, if you have a kid, 
92 or 3 mm -hmm. something. Right. Is that like you can even reverse that you know, to be. No, the, you're exactly right. It is an effective treatment, not a cure. We are not curing myopia here. I wish we could. Maybe one day we'll have a way that we can. It's a treatment. So um, on one hand, it's kind of like wearing glasses. You can wear glasses during the day. You can do overnight sight at night. And either way, you're going to see clearly the benefit of it is to stabilize it. Right. Not to reverse it permanently. If we stop them wearing it all together, they're going to return to that pretreatment range, just hopefully not very much stronger than that. And I also tell parents, I would love to be able to guarantee every parent that comes in that their child will never get more nearsighted. I can't do that. We can't control the genetic part, right? We can control the environmental part, cross our fingers on the genetic part, but these more recent studies are showing that, fortunately, the part we can control, the environmental part, is probably the slightly bigger component. So uh, we find we slow it down a lot. In some cases, we stop the progression altogether. In other cases, we don't, but slowing it down is still very, very beneficial for <coughs> children. Yeah. Yes? I have a question. So like adults, they cannot, if they have the myopia, they cannot benefit from the oversight. Well, they can benefit. It depends on your answer. I can fit an adult in ortho K. I don't fit nearly as many adults because I'm just a myopia control guy. But most of the adults I fit are because I fit their children and they decide they want to try it. An adult can wear it. It's an absolutely effective and reasonable alternative to wearing glasses or contacts. The reason why we do so much more with kids are, with children there's two benefits, two concrete, very clear benefits. One is no glasses or contacts during the day. The other is slowing down the progression of the prescription. Mm -hmm. Well, with adults, they're not likely progressing. Um, mm -hmm. Some adults, unfortunately, progress, but at a much lower rate. And so it's one of the two, right? We're still achieving clear vision without glasses or contacts. And for a lot of parents, um, for a lot of adults, that's well worth it. So I do have some adult parents. Did you try it? What's that? To use it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we don't have a ton of them, but we have plenty, and it works every bit as good. Um, there are plenty of clinics out there that fit way more adults than they do children. Um, yes? So what if like, the kids go travel for a week and not using the contact overnight, and then come back to use it later? So, in terms of coming back to use it, there's no problem. They'll come back and they'll start using and their vision will clear right on up. As far as when they are out of town, yeah, they're going to be blurry if you don't have some sort of backup plan. And so what we do depends a little on how nearsighted the child is. If they have a low prescription and they're not in school and they're on vacation and they're hanging out with their friends or going camping, sometimes there are patients who just decide to be a little blurry for a week. They're going out to camp. Maybe they don't have access to the hygiene to wash their hands. However, um, if they have a high prescription, a lot of times parents will elect to have a backup pair of glasses. And usually what we'll do is we'll make that roughly equal to their pre-treatment prescription. And that way, if something happens and the child can't wear it for a few days, they have a way to see clearly in the meantime. So we, we depend, that depends on the individual patient. Okay. I do not require them to have a pair of glasses, but for higher prescriptions, I encourage them to because they're a little more comfortable if they can't wear them. Yes? Do you have a card or like handouts? Yes, yeah. Rhonda has cards and handouts, and, okay. and you're welcome to yeah, the place to take them. Um, we have two handouts here. One is specifically <laughs> on the overnight site program. The other is on myopia control in general and kind of outlines the epidemic there and some of the things we do to control it. And we both certainly have business cards from both myself and Rhonda. Yes? Okay, see so you. Do you provide all the options or are you Yes, the consultation is for ortho is for orthokeratology and the other options. Now, how we proceed depends on the individual child. I have a lot of, fortunately, most of our patients, I would say, come to us either through our clinic where we've discussed it a little bit at the patients who have gone through our program. So some patients who come in referred by other orthokeratology patients come in already kind of with their mind made up that if that's an option they want to do it. And if that's the case, then we concentrate more on that. But we have plenty of patients that just want to know their options. Um, one of the reasons why I developed the myopia control brochure that we use is because if a parent comes in and they have a child who's just been diagnosed with myopia, it's a lot of information to digest. A lot of times the patient, the parent is a little concerned, a little worried. They're not prepared to make a decision as to, do I want to do overnight sight? Do I want to do glasses? They don't know. And that's a way for us to give them a, an easy to digest little brochure that gives them all their different options and then they can read over that between their exam and when they come back from a myopia control consult and maybe have some idea how they want to proceed and, and ask some questions based on that. So. 
It really depends on the patient. I have some that come in already knowing they don't want to do overnight site for one reason or another. They just think they'll do better with a different um, option. So our goal is to lay out the options for you and help you make the best decision. And I'll certainly give my opinion on what would be best for an individual child. In about 75 to 80% of the cases, it is overnight site, but we're happy to do whatever. My, my thought process is some form of myopia control is way better than none. And with us having the various options available we have now, the great news from that is basically any patient that comes in with an issue with, with a myopia diagnosis, we can help them in one way or another to slow down their progression. Yes? Uh, so you mentioned that the mold can cause some discomfort yes. to some patients. Mm -hmm. So what's the percentage? Of children that cannot it depends discover. on your definition of discomfort. You know, I generally describe it as an awareness. It's not, oh gosh, my eye hurts. It's, wow, that's different. I'm not so sure I'm in love with the comfort of this because it is something new for them. These are young kids. They've almost never worn contact lenses of any sort before. So what I usually, the way I do it in my clinic, and it works pretty well, usually I'll go ahead and I'll put that in for them in the clinic when they come in for the evaluation. And I'll say, hey, I want you to pay attention. When you blink, you know how you can feel it move up and down? It feels weird, right? You move your eye back and forth and you can feel it. Now close your eye gently. And what they'll find is when they close their eye gently like they're going to sleep, they don't feel it nearly as much. They can tell it's there, but the sensation has decreased quite a bit when their eye is closed and it's not moving. And then I'll say, okay, so that's how you're gonna wear it when you go to sleep. You're gonna put this in the last thing, you're gonna close your eyes and go to sleep. And that usually puts their mind at ease that, yeah, I can do this. I'm gonna put it in, I'm gonna close my eyes and go to sleep. And that awareness diminishes over the first week. And most patients, when they come in for their one-day follow-up, we do a one-day follow-up with every patient. They usually say, yeah, it was kind of annoying last night. I was ready to take it out this morning. And when they come back for their one-week follow-up and I ask them how they tolerate it, they say, yeah, I'm getting used to it. It's not a big deal anymore. So, uh, you know, patient, kids are resilient. They do a really good job. If we can get buy-in from them and they understand what they stand to gain from it, you know, clearer vision without their glasses, keeping their prescription under control and things like that, uh, they get through that first week and they're doing really good just fine after that typically. So it's a good question. There is some of that, but I think when I, the way I've got in my clinic where I explain it to them, I think that helps them understand, okay, it feels weird, it's not something that's 100% comfortable, but I can do this. So. Um, one more question. Yeah. So what is their youngest age? So their so our standard age is eight, but I go younger than eight all the time. It depends on the patient. I have fit several seven-year-olds, and I fit one or two six-year-olds, although that's rare. Um, they, need, they need to be mature enough to not to take care of it on their own. The beautiful thing about this, and one of the reasons why we skew younger than normal contacts is, the earlier we can treat myopia, the better we can control it. Because not only is it a matter of that the younger they become myopic, the more myopic they'll come, they actually progress at a more rapid rate at younger ages. We tend to see the fastest progression between like 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 year olds, and then it starts to taper a little. And while 14, 15, 16 year olds do become more nearsighted, it's not quite at the same rate most of the time. So I'd love to get them young if I can. They don't have to be able to take care of the lenses by themselves. They don't have to be able to put in the molds by themselves. I have plenty of patients that start young and the parents help them with lens putting in, taking out with, uh, with care of the molds. But the beauty of it is because they're only wearing it at night, not at school, we can do that, right? You don't have to worry that they're gonna get to school and not be able to handle it, not be able to take it out. So if, what we need is a child who can understand the process and get a little buy-in for them to cooperate a little bit with their parents. So typically seven to eight, I've gone a little younger than that on occasion. And it's FDA approved for every age. The FDA approval is for every age. Um, so. So, uh, yeah. so any stage is okay, even like um, the kid has wear the glasses for years. So any case is a good candidate? Um, the length of time wearing glasses has no bearing on it. Um, we, can, we can fit a child who's been wearing glasses for a really long time. How good of a candidate they are does depend a little on their prescription. Hard, higher prescriptions are harder. It doesn't mean we can't do it, but they're more difficult. Um, higher amounts of astigmatism absolutely are more difficult. And sometimes I'll see a patient where I just say, hey, you know, this is going to be really tough to get really clear vision. And in that case, we have options. Sometimes we will move to a soft contact design, even though it may not provide the same level of myopia control we can get some control and get sharper vision. Other times, what we'll do if someone comes in and they're a, they're a young kid and they're already a minus 10.0, and I'll just tell them flat out, I don't think I can correct every bit of that with ortho -K. But the really cool thing is partial correction works every bit as good for myopia control. So if someone came in and let's say they were a 10, maybe I correct 
seven diopters with ortho K, and they wear a lower prescription pair of glasses to see during the day. They wear a minus 3.0 glasses. Yeah, they're not completely free from glasses, but we're still controlling myopia every bit as good as if I treated every bit of that. So again, it goes back to, we have so many options, right? Um, so the length of time wearing it doesn't matter. The amount of myopia, but it certainly does matter. There are more difficult cases, they get higher. But I've tackled plenty of high cases. Sometimes we do better than we think we will, and we actually get them free from glasses. Sometimes we treat most of it, and they get a low prescription pair of glasses to take care of it. So like, um, through the life stage, um, yes. for example, like maybe adults yep. they don't progress anymore. So right. Are you confident if they um, use this auto K from young age to maybe adult age? Yes, sir. And then, uh, is that possible they won't need, like, later in their life? Like, they don't have to wear the auto K or any glasses? No, they're, they're going to have to wear glasses again if they stop the ortho K. Um, uh, to answer your question, no, that they, again, like, a, for the gentleman, oh, yeah, here, not I'm not carrying it, cure, yes. I'm treating it. So it will help control the level. It will help keep it from progressing as much, keep it at a lower level. But yes, ma'am, if they stop wearing it, they will need some form of vision correction. And once they reach adulthood and they're not likely to progress, they have choices. I have patients who decide, I really like wearing ortho I want to keep wearing it. They're off to college. I had a patient come in just a couple weeks ago who's, uh, she's a junior at Carolina now, and she's still wearing them. She loves them. I have other patients who decide, well, if I'm not likely to progress anymore, maybe I want to wear a regular soft lens or wear glasses. And so they have options, um, and, and I talk to them about that. We just decide based on the individual patient. So the regular soft lens, uh, that also like everyday change? It depends on the, on the lens. So, and again, to be clear, and I think you understand this, but it's not a regular lens. It is soft lens. From the patient's perspective, looking on the finger, it looks and feels about the same, but it is very specifically designed for myopia control. Um, there are two products we use. One is a daily disposable. One is a three-month disposable. Because of convenience, we use the daily every chance we get. It's just easier. But if they have astigmatism, um, the daily doesn't work. We have to use the, the three-month lens. So, it, that, so the amount of care involved, obviously with the three-month lens, you have to clean it every night, keep it clean. The daily, you throw it in the trash can, start with the fresh one the next day. So. so it looks like the most effective one is the overnight. In my experience, it is. There are doctors who do mostly atropine. There are doctors who do mostly soft. There are doctors who do mostly ortho -K. I do more ortho -K than the others because my experience is it is the most effective. But the great thing is you can combine them too. Um, I have had patients do ortho -K and atropine. I have no hesitation at all prescribing atropine if we're getting some progression despite a really good ortho -K treatment. Same thing with soft. I have patients who we fit them in the soft for whatever reason they're not a candidate for ortho -K and they get a little progression. Yeah, totally. We'll redesign, we'll change the ortho -K, we'll add atropine. Um, the, the process of following it is to make sure that while I can't guarantee they will never become more nearsighted, that we are doing everything within our power to keep them from becoming more nearsighted. Any other questions? As you said, uh, there are so few doctors around the world. Mm -hmm. Like when they grow up, they will move out like from parents, so they have to find a new doctor or? They do, but to, but to be clear, it's not that there's fewer than 150 doctors doing ortho -K, and I want to make sure careful that I'm ortho and who do myopia control, who are not a fellow of the academy. And it doesn't mean they're not any good at it. I have colleagues that I have great confidence in that are not fellows of the academy. I mentioned that in the presentation because that is one way to differentiate. If you're looking and you move to a town and you look and see, gosh, there's four different doctors around who do this and I don't know who to pick, that's one way to try to differentiate. Um, if you don't have someone to ask, if you don't have a referral from a friend that says, oh, this person's really good, that's one way to know that that person has had uh, some additional training and expertise. But there are other doctors who do it, uh, and I've had patients move away that I've found a colleague to refer them to on several occasions. Anything else? So in your office, you do, like for example, um, the regular patient came, they, they also you prescribe um, glasses? Yes, ma'am. Regular eye exam and totally. glasses? Yes. Until, for the first half of the life of my office, we didn't do ortho -K. It was just becoming, you know, it's become a lot more common. Uh, the data behind it has become better. So uh, we do tons of routine care in our office. We treat lots of adults and kids, regular general eye exams, glasses, regular contact lenses, um, vision exams, treatment of eye infections and injuries and disease and things like that. And then we have our clinic within a clinic, our orthokeratology or our myopia control clinic 
that we set up certain times of our, of our clinic times that's dedicated for Rhonda and I to work with those patients on the myopia control. So we refer ourselves, we'll see them for a routine exam and say, well, if you would like to do myopia controls, bring you back with a myopia control visit to provide you your options and do the testing you need to decide how to, how to proceed. So you mean the first uh, visit would be just a regular, we can just make an appointment for Absolutely. regular eye, eye Yeah, check. if they're due yeah. for an exam and haven't had one in a year, that's where you want to start. Get a regular exam, find out what their vision is, are they myopic, if so, have they progressed, things like that, mm -hmm. and, then, and then move on from there. All right, thank you so much guys for coming out. Thank you so much for